Hello, everyone. Welcome to Season 1, Episode 13 of the Fan Fiction Tapes. A trope roundtable on the five-man band trope. I am your host, Maya, and today I am joined by... Dylan, hi. Uh, Riley. And I am our producer, Ian. Alright, to start things off, what is a five-man band? Some of you who are more familiar with the genre or familiar with the show Trope Talk, uh, made by Overly Sarcastic Productions over on YouTube, you might know of this, but for l listeners who aren't, Five Man Band is kind of the name for a group of five characters that are the central focus of the story. These are going to be usually your protagonists. Although you can, you can sometimes do some unusual stuff there. But in most cases, these are going to be your protagonists, and there's going to be kind of a set of typical traits for them. And for this, we're going to use the way Red from OSP talks about it, because it's a pretty decent system. You have your leader, your lancer, your smart guy, your strong guy, and your heart, usually. Um, sometimes these will be interchangeable, but that's usually what you can break them down into. For a history of the five-man band, this is... This is an old trope. Probably one of the oldest um, that I think we'll be talking about here on the show for a while. None of the others... Uh, well, MacGuffins are old, but this, this one's very old. Uh, OSP Red traces it back to as early as Journey to the West, which is interesting because even as she talks about it, Journey to the West doesn't truly embody a five-man band. As there's more four central characters to it. Depends on whether you count the horse. Yes. The examples that I saw coming up most were like Power Rangers. And uh, they did talk about how sometimes there were six and the different um, kind of stereotypes that each would fulfill. Yeah, Power Rangers is a pretty well-known usage of it. That's probably the most well-known. If we want to talk about Power Rangers... <laughs> oh, no. Uh, oh, Dylan, so, get on your soapbox. Yeah, sure. So, obviously, uh, Power Rangers is uh, an adaptation of a Japanese tokusatsu show called Super Sentai. Super Sentai started in the uh, late 70s uh, with... It's Mu Sentai Go Ranger. Go Ranger focused on five characters. They then moved on to Jacka. Jacka had four and introduced a fifth later. And they sort of repeated that with various, you know, most of the time it would be a focus on three to five, sometimes adding the fight, uh, you know, to get to five later, whatever. The, the thing with Power Rangers is the first Sentai season it adapted, uh, which was uh, Jew Ranger, uh, was the first Sentai season to incorporate the idea of a Sith Ranger, uh, one who would join later. So that's the interesting thing here that we. <laughs> that Power Rangers barely ever just has five. Um, mm -hmm. If I'm thinking about it, I think only. In Power Rangers, I think only Dino Thunder actually only has five. Yes, uh, turbo technically, but they have other stuff. But yeah, that's uh, really the history they end. You know, we've had various sizes of uh, teams since. I think the largest, I think, would... Uh, in Power Rangers, that would be uh, uh, Dino Charge. I think they hit 10. Oh my goodness. And then in Sentai, it was, the name is escaping me. Excuse me. Ah, Q Ranger. Uh, Q Ranger ended up with a rotational <laughs> uh, squad of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 11, 12 Rangers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Incredible. Um... Yeah. Before we go a little bit too far down the Super Sentai rabbit hole, perhaps we should actually elaborate what some of those roles 
I mentioned earlier actually mean. Some of them are kind of easy to guess, but some of them, in particular, the Lancer, aren't as obvious. The Lancer, starting with that one, usually acts as a narrative foil to your leader character. They are... Within the group, they're kind of the almost a function of a devil's advocate. They frequently disagree and conflict with the leader, but will ultimately end up supporting the leader. Um, if you want examples of good Lancers, Zuko from Avatar, The Last Airbender, is an example of a good Lancer. Well... <laughs> Once he joins the group, that is. Takes him a minute. Your smart guy and your strong guy, pretty basic terms. They are characters whose main contribution to your five-man band is either that they're smart, you know, they come up with plans, or have intelligence that acts to significantly aid the band in other ways, or their main thing is... Be strong, hit stuff. Yeah. Um, I believe, continuing with the last airbender analogy, Sokka and... <sighs> I always forget her name. Toph. Thank you, Toph. Would be I've always... the equivalent. Oops, go on, guys. I've always looked at Sokka as kind of an underappreciated, like he's treated as a comic relief most of the time, but he does come up with some really good ideas. He's a real ideas guy, even though for a while his <laughs> ideas are kind of not Poofy. good, but he does have a nice character arc for becoming kind of a leader and strategizing on one of their kind of wartime conquests. I forget. I think they were attacking the Fire Nation during a eclipse or something. And he yeah. had a point on that. The kind of the final arc. Sokka was always my favorite watching the show. Um, I don't think even even his ideas were always uh, starting out as kooky. It's more that his presentation of them was very goofy. Like he's he's kind of always had good ideas. For sure, for sure. And then the last two we mentioned, the leader and the heart. The leader is. Basically, your main character, TM. Most of the audience is probably going to identify with this character, and they are usually the one who ends up, to some degree, in charge of the group. Is that a really central thing to the trope? Because I'm kind of thinking over those roles, and having spent a lot of time reading the Bionicle lore... There's the six characters, each identified by a color and a very prominent, like, uh, physical sort of specialty and also a personality. Like, there's the funny one, the calm one, the really cold and uh, uncaring one, and then a couple that just want everyone to be happy and are kind of mediators of the group. And then there's the one guy who just gets angry so easily. Um, I would call Tahu probably the leader because... And I think a lot of the, like, some of the early books, they definitely try to play into that, and they have him in a leadership role, but it never really feels like like there's a good part of the beginning where he's a bad leader, and the other series, like, with Vakama, he, he had a really bad job as a leader starting, but... um at the same time, like, as all the characters developed, they never really struck me as the sort of team with any sort of hierarchy to it. Yeah, I, th I think leader's probably not a great word for it, but... I don't want to make another Power Rangers reference right now, but um, as uh, it was said in RPM, red's the leader, black's the brooding bad boy, green's the funny guy, and yellow, well, she's the girl. What does that make you? I'm Scottish. <laughs> <laughs> It was describing, nearly describing Bionicles as well there for a bit. Because <laughs> uh, Onua doesn't do any brooding. I think that's all left to Kopaka. So. 
Tahu too. Tahu gets some brooding in. Yeah. You you know you really gotta worry when Lou is brooding though. That that's that's a uh, that yes serious. that is a big concern moment. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that, that was uh, probably my largest exposure to the trope. You know what? That was probably also my largest childhood exposure to five man bands because a lot of the big examples of it, you know, Avatar: The Last Airbender, Full Metal Alchemist. I didn't. Okay, no, no, the the. <laughs> okay, I might get a little bit of hate for this one, but my biggest childhood exposure to the five man band was MythBusters. <laughs> I don't hate that i think that they were really good about um saying they were doing the scientific method even if they didn't always really demonstrate it but yeah those were a lot of uh personalities often at pretty great tension with themselves well it's i love mythbusters it's why i pursued the degree i did in college but (laughs) so you have jamie as kind of your leader he's kind of technically in charge, I believe, and Adam is the lancer to Jamie. Yeah. Carrie would, by typical terms, be shunted into the heart, and I think she actually kind of filled that role naturally on her own. Grant definitely falls into the um, brains category, even amongst a cast of very intelligent individuals. And that leaves Tori with the brawn, which given what he got up to in several seasons, I think makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I, I never actually really thought about Mythbusters in that way until about, like, 30 seconds ago. Yeah, I wouldn't have either, for sure. Well, we've kind of moved into what I want to talk about, was examples of the five-man band. We've kind of worked into that a little bit earlier than I'd planned. It is something that's hard to talk about with exam- without examples. Yes. Yeah. Um, and something I want to bring up with for listeners who are familiar with the genre of games, commonly shorthanded as TTRPGs or tabletop role-playing games, you're likely most familiar with this in the form of D&D, but other games such as Lancer, Thirsty Sword Lesbians, Pathfinder, among the many, many others, also fall into this category. This is also related to our next episode, which will be about a particular D&D game in which Ian, Dylan, and I play. But these games often see the development of five-man band-like structures, even if they aren't necessarily exactly five. I mean, Maya, I think for a long time, uh, both the games that we regularly participate in had uh, five-person structures, obviously. And I think we developed uh, t- quite... We developed a dynamic, you know, within the group that I play in, I don't DM. W- what would you say I was? <laughs> <laughs> you know, that what? dynamic is... <laughs> That dynamic is you stuffed five wild animals into a bag. Have fun with it. <laughs> oh my. Nye is a lancer that doesn't support the ideas afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> He's just like, well, we're, I guess we're doing this. <laughs> Great. Uh, one of the recent popular examples, I guess, is Vox Machina with uh, getting its own TV show that just got a second season, I think. And... Pulling the words out of my mouth. <laughs> that, that's what I was about to say. Um, was well, yeah, Vox Machina, which yeah, the second season recently aired. Uh, I love it. Excellent show. Also, it has one of my favorite voice actors ever, Lance Reddick, who unfortunately recently passed. Mm-hmm. But that show... You can fit many of the characters within the uh, party of protagonists into the five-man band trope, but I don't think you can necessarily qualify the entire group for a five-man band, partly because, as I recall, there are six. 
seven. But you have Grog, who fulfills the brawn. You have Percy, who, at least in the animated show, although I'm less familiar with the podcast, definitely acts as the brains. And the anger. <laughs> it, he is, yes, he is, he is also the anger. He is an angsty boy. And then there's Vex and Vax, which um, I get them confused so much, but I think uh, Vex is the guy that's always... Nope. <laughs> trying... Nope, nope, nope. nope. That's Vax. <laughs> Vax is the guy that's always <laughs> trying to keep up with his sister, I guess. And he thinks he has to have all this responsibility, but I don't think he's really ready for it, usually. But he grows into it. I wouldn't know. I can't pay attention to the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, as someone who has watched all of Campaign 1 and Campaign 2, <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I can give some... Uh, you know, insight. Obviously, they each have their roles, and uh, within the D and D format, obviously Ashley Johnson had other commitments, so Pike couldn't always be there. Uh, so it, for a large portion, it is the six. Uh, you know, Percy, the twins, uh, Grog, Keyleth, uh, and Scanlan, and they sort of, you know, all fill their roles. Scanlan is hilarious. Grog is hilarious. Percy is, as Talison, his player, would describe, is a terrible person <laughs> who does Percy has things. issues. Mm-hmm. Yes! <laughs> his issues have issues. <laughs> Percy doesn't have issues, he has magazines. <laughs> <laughs> oh um, Mikhailif, uh is very much the heart of the of Vox Malkina, you know. Absolutely, yeah. And you have Vex, who's very cynical, you know, I feel like, and sort of at times is like the leader, you know, just because uh, she <laughs> controls the money. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and you have Vax. Vax is very much sort of the main character I would describe him I know there is no main yeah. character in D&D but he is like the driving force of a lot of big events later on it, so, it depends yeah. on the party whether or not you have a main character I, I've been in a couple of games where intentionally or not there has been a main character and that's not necessarily too that's not necessarily a bad thing it can be but in the games I've run well, not the games I've run, but the games I've been in, there's been a main character and it's been fine. Um, actually, I would argue Dylan's game has a main character, and I think we're all pretty fine with that. Yeah. Um, for games I've run, I actually kind of lean into that a little bit sometimes um, if I'm coming up with um, arcs to have the campaign go through. I'll try i'll try and rotate that around the group but like it's it's a lot easier for the, for my mental housekeeping as the dm if the focus of the arc is this one particular character this one particular player's character's backstory or whatever is kind of the focus of the campaign hmm. and don't 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 lie you like that there's a main character so you don't get bullied as much <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Just watching the main character, you know, elect Hara, getting bullied while you two, you know, uh, try and commit do... shenanigans. Yeah, yeah, in the background, avoiding the eye of me. And then when you do catch it, <laughs> me being me, I, you know. You I, send you... us to jail. Yeah. Literally. <laughs> Bonk. Um, so I think this is a good time for a transition to things about the five-man band we do and don't like. Which, this could be sometimes probably a bit polarizing. I like seeing five-man bands, and I like using them. They are a quick and dirty way to establish 
character dynamics, and in particular, one dynamic that often comes from the five-man band is the big guy, smart guy dynamic. I like the interactions there, I find them fun, and sometimes when playing D&D, I will try to arrange a big guy, smart guy dynamic. I, I think that five-man bands tend to kind of a, generate rather organically when people are designing characters. Everything needs kind of a foil to go off of. But uh, one of the things that I've found is like, I don't like when people set out to make a five man band for the sake of it. And I feel like that tends to lead to very shallow, no depth characters. Like when someone's identity as a character is their place in the band, that becomes really, uh, I guess, boring. I, I mean, there might be some implementations that end up really well, but it seems like the kind of thing that you don't want to set out to make it. You want to make what you want to make. And if you identify that it's turned into a five-man band, there's definitely room to play with that. But setting out just to make a group of tropes just for the sake of them fitting together in, I guess, a way that's profitable, that doesn't work so well with me. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that can that can happen with, with a lot of tropes if you're just sitting out to use the trope for the sake of the trope. In the case of the five-man band in particular, I feel like the big guy and smart guy are probably the most likely to fall into that sort of flat characterization where they are just there to be smart or be strong and hit stuff. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I think, uh, like the example of Vox Machina, they get away from that really well by having uh, Grog actually have a lot of character depth. He he has this whole thing. It's like, where does your strength come from? And it, I thought that was a really great character arc to like take away his strength and see what he is as a character without just being able to rage and punch things. Yes, and Percy having. In addition to being smart, incredible anger issues, and lots of trauma, makes him a fun character beyond being smart, right? There is more to him. He is not a one-dimensional character. He's yeah. also... The thing with Percy as well is Percy also knows he's the smartest person around. <laughs> or believes he is. <laughs> so... That has a lot of interesting interaction when he's wrong. <laughs> you know, because he just assumes, oh, I know about this, obviously. And then it blows up in his face. <laughs> that could be fun as well, yes. I'm trying to think of any implementations that I just really didn't like. I mean, I know the stuff that's maybe designed for children, like Disney has put out a lot of that sort of character creation set and shows like high school musical were very fun to watch but also the characters tended to have very narrow personalities and they didn't really get that far away from it either i mean it was supposed to be high school <laughs> yes <laughs> and high school never ends in terms of things i don't like about it i feel like you know i think it's a little bit arbitrary sometimes, like it's not always intentional when, you know, you're just making a group of people, you know, I think trying to put everything into the five-man band sort of idea or like trope is trying to put something where it's actually not. And I think, you know, it may be more down to the naming of the trope itself than the actual application, uh, but, you know, it's not, it's not common in any way that the story you know centers or has a five person group with you know the personalities you would typically find in one so that that would be my criticism it seems like sort of an arbitrary trope like is it any time that we have you know a sort of group of people more than four that we immediately have to apply this trope, I don't think we should. Like, it's more that, you know, it's there, you know. I mean, it, you know, 
you can count on like one hand or maybe two like literal five pe person groups that lasted you know through an entire show like I can name all the Sentai teams that came before uh, Zoo Ranger but uh, you know that's from a different time different era you know <laughs> Uh, if you'll allow me to be a little bit uh, visibly queer on the podcast, <laughs> yes. the kind of some of the issues you have with it, Dylan, is to really to perfectly fit the five man band, you have to fit people into boxes. And the trouble with people is they don't fit in boxes. Very true. I thought you were just going to go straight into she or something. <laughs> <laughs> Um, if you are fitting your characters into these boxes and you're, you know, making the corners fit and everything, maximum volume usage, well, then you don't have a character that's a person, you have a character that is a box. And that is a quick way to be boring as hell and also lame. Yeah. And... Yeah, okay, I'll stop myself before I go on a tangent about people. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so... I guess this kind of ties into uh, our final point, unless, Ian, you have anything you'd like to say about what you do and don't like about... Nah, we can carry on. Uh, advice for writing a five-man band. Well, we've kind of talked about it a little bit. Don't make your characters fit exactly into those boxes and don't only start out just to write a five-man band set out to write people too absolutely uh, my advice would always be to focus on whatever size of the party you have you know five six seven eight nine ten uh focus on like the important relationships between those people but also develop the minor relationships you know I think that's something always important you've got to consider. Is that, sure, you have the siblings or the people in a relationship, but you also have to make sure that the other people also interact with each other. Not just always wedded to the idea that within your larger party, these two are a pair. These two always have to be with each other. I think it's important to separate and put them with different people every once in a while. Yeah, there are 26 possible combinations in a group of five people. Don't just focus on, like, four. Absolutely. Yes, I agree with what Ian and Dylan have said. I think the most important part about a five-man band isn't the individual boxes you have here, but the interactions between the characters that make up the five-man band. It doesn't matter, really, if you have one leader, one lancer, one smart guy, one big guy, one heart. But what matters is the interactions between the five individuals who comprise your group. That's the interesting part. And I guess for people who are setting out to specifically write a five-man band, whether they want to have color-themed characters or they want to really play into comfortable, familiar tropes for people, then the focus is still just to... If you're going to describe a character with one word, make sure you find other words besides. Like, it, don't just say, oh, it's the strong guy. I'm done making the character. There's a lot to be made outside of that role if you're going to set out just to make a five man band. Yeah, um, I used to kind of talk a little bit about that. Something that I did that was a mistake was one of my D&D characters that I play, I set out to make a strong guy, or well, strong gal, but <laughs> most of her starting personality and interactions were be strong, hit stuff. Mm -hmm. And definitely the first couple sessions of that game, her character has felt a little flat. There's not much to her, and I, I need to, to make her more interesting develop more characterization. I've started a little bit of that with doing some stuff with fear, but I need to do some more work there. Okay, we are about out of time on the Zoom meeting. 
Uh, do we have any mail in the mailbag yet, Ian? Uh, we do not. So if you guys listening have anything that you want to send us, that you want us to talk about on the show, or if you just want to share it with us, you can email us at fanfictapes at gmail.com. Uh, you can also leave us a comment on our YouTube video, uh, uh, rating and review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Um, and you can also reach out to us on Twitter. Maya, what's our Twitter? Uh, it is at fanfic tapes. Or sorry, no, at fanfiction tapes. I've said that wrong on almost every single episode, despite looking at it on my phone each time. Well, I always have to double check the Gmail. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and then for the prompt for this week is write a short story with a five-man band that does not conform to the usual structure we have mentioned here. Before we all go, Riley, do you have any social media or works you would like to promote on the podcast? I only really have the one work. Uh, my website is Riley Quinn the Fool with no spaces or capitalization. I guess that doesn't really matter for a website. But um, yeah, I wrote a book called The Fool, The Lovers, The Devil. And it does have five kind of characters that play off each other, though it really does condense down to three and in the interactions between each pair within that. Um but yeah, it's a romance. It's the gayest thing I've ever written. And the only thing I have to promote here. It's very gay, very good. And before Zoom kicks us out, I am, have been Maya. I am, and always will be, Dylan. I am Riley Quinn. And I am Ian. That's all for now. Bye. <laughs>